Well, good morning, everyone. How are we? Okay. okay. How are we? <laughs> good. Good. I'm so glad to see you all here. I'm so glad to have everyone joining us online. I pray that the Lord just ministers to each of you, whether you're here in person or you are located elsewhere today. I pray that the Holy Spirit just ministers to you through the preaching of his word today. I was um, thinking about that last night, actually, about how much, you know, I just, it's a good thing that I love this, um, but how, how much I just love um, shepherding and pastoring pastoring particularly through the preaching of God's word and it's just um, my favorite thing to do um, and I believe that's why the Lord called me to it and and it's just um, a, a good and an excellent thing when we can study the word together um, whenever I take the pulpit which we don't actually have a pulpit <laughs> um, my goal is to make much of Jesus and his word I don't come to give you a pep talk or a motivational speech. Um, I, I want to see you become a healthier and holier follower of Jesus. And, and that's what this entire series has really been about. Um, that said, just as a preface, the, the first few minutes of today's talk uh, will feel like less of a, a sermon from the scriptures and more like a sanctified TED talk, if you will. Um, but I promise we will eventually get to the message that God has for us today in his word. Um, so if you do not have a Bible, we have a Bible for you underneath your seats. You're welcome to grab those and use those. And if you don't have a Bible at home, you're welcome to take that home with you. They're completely free. We love to give them away. And so we're going to be in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 through 23. So you can go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. Uh, if you're using the church Bible, that's page 650. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 19 through 23. I'll give you just a moment to turn there. Um, over the years that I have served as a pastor in a local church, I have observed um, the relational dynamics of many people. And I don't strictly mean the relational dynamics between church members, although I've obviously seen a lot of that. Um, I also mean the relational dynamics between a congregant and the people they know that have never attended our church, uh, their family, friends, local people from the community. And it's funny, um, something that you quickly learn as a local church pastor is how you can almost always gauge someone's spiritual health by observing their relational health. What do I mean? Well, um, our relationship with God and our relationships with the people around us are deeply interwoven. That's not my idea. Um, that's a New Testament idea, one that's preached by Jesus and the apostles. Um, people who love their neighbors well are people who are very close to Jesus. And otherwise, those who have a, a hindrance or a resistance to loving their neighbors are obviously um, at least straying, if not altogether disconnected from Christ. You learn this a lot in the biblical counseling room. It's why Jesus presents love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as two sides of the same coin. It's why Peter declares in, in 2 Peter chapter 1 that the defining mark, the, the arrival point, if you will, of spiritual maturity is actually love. <laughs> it's why John the Apostle says in 1 John, if anyone loves God but does not love his brother, then he does not know God, for God is love. And it's why James, in, in James chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, he, he's the brother of Jesus, imagine that, <laughs> says that the reason that we have so much fighting and quarreling between us is actually because we've not invited God to do the transforming work of reordering the desires within us. Uh, the point is this, how we interact socially has something to say about how we are doing spiritually. And it isn't that our horizontal relationships are deciding for us our vertical relationship. 
but that our uh, vertical relationship informs our horizontal relationships. And that is why Paul, in all of his letters, begins with basic theology and a clear presentation of what it means to be reconciled with God before he ever addresses any relational strife or disunity between the people. Because right relationship and union with God will always provide a solution for the enmity that we experience with those around us. Now, (laughs) all of these statements were intended to be an extensive on-ramp for eventually presenting two questions. Uh, The first, um, what do the social lives of present-day Americans generally look like? And second, what does it mean to live with the love of God as our center? So let's begin with the first question. Um, I think there's much to say in answering this first question, but one particular thing that I've noticed about Americans, especially, I would say, in this region, is that our social lives are compiled of um, what sociologists call transactional relationships. And, And don't think simply of the relationship that you have with a grocery store checkout employee. It's much bigger than that. Um, Having transactional relationships means that you solely interact with people who benefit you in some way. We usually won't invest in a relationship with someone who isn't serving us, our goals and dreams, our agenda, or our personal and professional growth. Uh, We don't mind helping the other person when they need it, but our primary focus in our relationships is if they are reciprocating at least double what I'm investing in them. (laughs) I'll scratch your back, uh, but I need you to scratch my back in a much more significant way for me to maintain a committed relationship with you. And the moment that I start to feel in any amount um, as though you no longer are benefiting me or perhaps even that you've just in the slightest way crossed me, I immediately become disinterested and indifferent toward you. And that's usually true of all of our relationships, family, friends, colleagues, even our church relationships. And it's why the relationship turnover rate for many of us is very short. Because we're only looking for how people help us and and serve us. And, And when that's over, then we're over. At the end of the day, it's really about how you benefit me. And most of all, what am I getting out of our relationship? Not what am I giving to it, but what am I getting out of our relationship? This eventually forces us into mostly interacting with those who think like us, act like us, and and maybe even have the same goals or dreams in life as us. We typically surround ourselves with people who are like us. (laughs) Um, Our church certainly holds firm convictions on many teachings of psychology, Um, but there was a really interesting observation from a recent study done by two distinguished professors of social psychology uh, concerning why we require similarity in our relationships. Um, Listen to one of their suggestions. Um, Chris Crandall notes, quote, you try to create a social world where you're comfortable, where you succeed, and where you have people you can trust and with whom you can cooperate to meet your goals. To create this, similarity is very useful and people are attracted to it most of the time. In other words, because you want to be comfortable and successful and you want your goals and your benefit, you look for people who are most similar to you because you believe that those people will serve your mission and your interests best. Unfortunately, Christians are often tempted to live the same way, um, to only hang around spaces that serve them in some way with people of similar thought and path. Christians are indeed humans too, 
And we certainly have a list of personal preferences, um, our, our personal goals and interests in this life. And we are also, as Christian believers even, uh, susceptible to consider those things, our goals, our interests in this life, as the first priority and qualifier for if and how we will relate to our family, our friends, um, strangers, and and other church congregants. Um, But we, brothers and sisters, have a higher standard. And we have a calling that is required of us. And this calling is the way of love. So that then leads us to our second question. What does it mean to live with the love of God as our center? Uh, To say it differently, what does it mean to actually carry out and practice the love of God in our interactions with all people? Uh, Those we know and don't know. Those we like and those we don't particularly like. What does love require of us? And how do we love others well in a real and practical way? How do we, um, in a sense, embody the love of God? Well, the first thing we must note is that our calling to love our neighbor requires that we be willing to serve different people with different interests. Um, we, we must actively fight against the natural fleshly desire to solely look out for number one, especially in how we choose to relate with others. Uh, oftentimes, the Spirit of God will lead us to cross paths with people who are uh, much different than we are who have different interests and and desires than we do. And love demands that we stay and persist in serving them anyway. Because Christ's love is never self-seeking. But it is always delighted to serve others. And there is a kind of service that is self-seeking, even in the church, (laughs) before it is delighted to to serve others. How do we know the difference? Uh, Richard Foster, the pastor and author of Celebration of Discipline, uh, one of the great classics on Christian spirituality, he writes on this extensively. Um, so, so I've talked about this in the past, I know, in a different sermon, um, but what's the difference between a self-righteous or, or especially a self-seeking type of Christian service and a, a Christian service that is Christ-like and is delighted to serve others. Well, um, I'll just give you a few. So um, a, a self-seeking type of Christian service, and, and I say Christian there loosely, obviously. Um, a, a self-seeking type of Christian service is one that is predominantly led in human effort. And the other one, the Christ-like service, is one that is moved by God's prompting. The self-seeking is obsessed with the big deal, right? You only do, you only serve and invest yourself in the big projects. But the Christ-like service is willing to do small, trivial things like wash feet. The self-seeking service requires external rewards, while the Christ-like service is content in hiddenness. Um, self-seeking concerned with results. Christ-like, freely given, with no followed expectation. Um, Here's a big one. The self-seeking service chooses whom they're going to serve. But the Christ-like service does not discriminate in their service. And and just one more. Self-seeking service is often affected by moods and whims. I, 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 if I feel like it, I'll go and, and serve. <laughs> but if I don't feel like it, if it's, it's just not the right day for it, I'm just going to you know, say, eh, I'm not feeling this today, and I'll back out. But the Christ-like service ministers to the needs despite your current mood. Now, in both of our main passages today from Scripture... We see an example set for us of love that is delighted in serving others. 
Our first passage is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. And just for some context, much of Paul's first letter that we have, at least, to the church at Corinth is addressing relational issues and disunity. And in this particular passage, Paul has been writing about his opportunity to demand his rights. <laughs> And just like we talked about last week, we all feel this tendency in our flesh to demand our rights, to fight for what we want and, and what we believe we deserve. But demanding our rights often makes us wrong. The way of love has instructed Paul down a different path. So we're going to read Paul's words to the believers at Corinth from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 19 through 23. It'll be with me on the screen. Paul says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. <laughs> to those outside of the law, I became as one outside of the law. And he says, I'm not being outside of the law of God, but under the law of Christ, um, so that I might win those outside of the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might, what, win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all means I might win some. I do it all, why? For the sake of the gospel that I may share, that I may share with them in its blessings. So let's just walk back through the text. So, beginning in verse 19, um, again, Paul talking about his opportunity to demand his rights as, a, as a, an apostle, right? As a, as a preacher of the word of God. And he says, though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I may win more of them, right? So, um, what Paul is essentially saying is, I don't owe anyone anything, <laughs> I'm not like in anyone's debt. I don't, I don't like have a, a, a debt that I have to pay to anybody. Nobody owns me, right? I don't owe anyone anything, but even though I don't owe anyone anything, I give them everything. I don't owe anyone, but I, I'm a servant to everyone. And, and Paul does this by his own choice. He says, I have made myself, um, your translation may say, I have chosen to be a servant to all. Why? So that he might win some of them over to Christ, to the gospel. Paul chooses intentionally to be a servant because love is not just a claimed feeling you have for someone. You don't just say, I love you or feel I love you. Love is, is demonstrated and manifested and seen through choosing to submit to the interests and needs of another. And so he says, um, to the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside of the law that I might win those outside of the law. To the weak, I became weak that I might what? Anybody? Win the week. <laughs> and I might win the week. And so I, I understand because of the, like, the re repetitious uh, verbiage here that it might have gotten a little confusing when we were reading it earlier. But um, 
Paul's not taking on various personalities. He doesn't have multiple personality disorder. He's not a chameleon, right? Um, He's not saying, I just become this, and then I go to this room, and I become that, and I I go to this space, and I become that. And, you know, some of us, this is not in the script, but some of us are like that. Like, depending on the people we're around, that's, you know, we have this personality, and then I see you another day, and and you're this. But, But Paul's not necessarily just, like transforming every time he visits a different group of people. He's also not compromising on his personal holiness or values. Um, that's, why, that's why he says, to those um, outside of the law, I became as one outside of the law, even though I'm not really outside of the law. So basically he's saying, I'm doing everything short of sinning against God to win these people over. Right, so he's not a he's not a chameleon. He doesn't just keep transforming, and and he's not necessarily compromising either. Paul is stepping into different spaces with different people who have different interests and serving them where they're at. He's becoming a servant in their space. He's walking into their room, into their circle, and joining with them. Not, not compromising, but joining with them to serve them where they're at, to serve their interests, so that he might win them over. Paul makes it his aim to, to gain their trust by making himself fully available to them as a servant. Why is Paul doing that? Is it to have a diverse group of friends? Is it to to build a good reputation in the local community? Is it to make people feel better about themselves? No, he he tells us why he does it um, in verse 22 and 23. He says, To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel. Why does he do it? For the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings, in the blessings of the gospel. Why does Paul do it? Because he wants to um, participate with them in the benefits of the gospel, the good news of the love of God. He wants to share in and with God's love. And so, what does he do? He, he demonstrates God's love through serving them. And he serves them to get them into God's love, <laughs> to help them understand God's love. And so, I want you to see how deeply connected the love of God and, and, and my path of servanthood are. But Paul wasn't just being a nice guy. Paul was following the example that was set for him in Jesus Christ himself. That is why Paul says elsewhere, uh, follow or imitate me as I follow and imitate Christ. If Paul's not imitating and following Christ, don't follow Paul. Follow and imitate me, Paul, as there's, that's like a, a contingency thing right there, right? As I follow and imitate Christ. If Jesus wasn't too good for it, then Paul knew he wasn't either. Jesus, not Paul, is the primary model for anything that Paul needs to teach to the believers. Uh, Paul describes the example that we have in Jesus in one of his most well-known writings, You can turn there with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'll begin in verse 3. This is what Paul says. He says, um, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Remember, he's writing to believers here. 
And this is what he says in verse 5. Have this mind, this attitude, this thought narrative among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he, Christ, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So again, just to walk back through the text, uh, going to verse 3, um, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Paul urges the church at Philippi, the believers, and, and also to us today, not to think too highly of ourselves, um, not to think too great of our ambitions or our desires. Um, he, he says, don't become entitled. We talked about entitlement a little bit last week. Um, don't become entitled. Um, don't become obsessed with your own interests, but instead, in humility, consider the interests and benefit of the other. Um, now, um, humility is not something that we can choose <laughs> or, or um, something that we can just decide and, and take on for ourselves. If you think you have humility, um, you may not. Uh, but we, we cannot decide humility, but we can learn it. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, so Paul says in verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves... And your translation probably says, which is yours in Christ Jesus. But a better translation, believe it or not, we don't, we don't go to this translation a whole lot, but believe it or not, the, the better translation would actually be the King James Version. The King James Version should say, which is also in Christ Jesus. So most of your translations will say, have this mind or this attitude among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. The King James Version actually says, which is also in Christ Jesus. And that's a better translation. Why? Because the point of this whole passage is, this isn't yours. <laughs> this attitude, this, 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 this mind is not um, your natural attitude. If it was, then Paul wouldn't have to say in verse 3 and 4, uh, he wouldn't have to remind us that not to think too highly of ourselves. Sorry, I'll eventually get that out. <laughs> if it was naturally yours, even as a believer, then, then Paul wouldn't have to say to the believers, do not think of yourself too highly. Now, notice the similarities in verse 6 and 7 between Jesus' example and Paul's example that we just read in 1 Corinthians 9. Jesus, who, um, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So he's talking about Jesus giving up his rights. Uh, Jesus does not stop being God. You'll, you'll hear some teach that. That's not at all a trustworthy teaching. Jesus did not stop being God. What he did is he, he gave up his rights as God, saying that equality with God was not a thing that I have to grasp or fight for. And so he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but instead he emptied himself. How? By taking the form of a servant. In other words, Jesus displayed his humility by taking the form of a servant. He, he stepped down from glory, from, from, from <laughs> being with the Father and the Spirit, and he took on the form of a servant. In other words, he identified himself as a servant, stepping into our space, a people much different than him. And so the text says that Christ became 
obedient. I think that's an interesting choice of words. Um, in, in another passage of scripture, the scripture teaches that Christ learned obedience through his suffering. And what does it mean that he learned obedience? Did he ever not know obedience? Did he, um, did he, was he ever not obedient that Christ then became obedient in Philippians 2? Um, we, we don't have time to really go there, but I'll, I'll have to skip that for today. Um, but the more important thing to note is how obedient Christ became. How far he carried out his servanthood. Paul says that he became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And how much greater a display of God's love than that? A bloody cross where he bore our brokenness. How much more a display of Christ's willingness to serve us and to act on our behalf and to seek out our good than the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is the defining act of Christ's servanthood that he'd be willing to die that I, in turn, may live. Again, we see how the love of God is manifested in servanthood. But that godly servanthood is ultimately practiced to bring us into the love of God. And that is, of course, why Jesus died. Paul says um, in another text, so that those who live would no longer live to themselves, to their own interests, to their own goals and agenda, uh, but for him who for their sake died and was raised again. The Father, in Philippians, uh, right after this text that we just read, the Father has exalted and lifted up Jesus, the suffering servant who died, and has given him the name above all names. But if even Jesus Christ can humble himself in this way, choosing the path of servanthood as a demonstration of God's love, then is this too good for us? That's why Paul gives an instruction for the believers directly after in Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 through 16. And this is what he says, do all things, everyone say all things, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast that's holding tightly, holding closely to the very word of life so that in the day of Christ, that is, in the day of Christ's return, I may be proud that Paul himself did not run in vain or labor in vain. Not once did we see Christ demand his rights. Not once did we see Christ argue or complain. Because servants don't do that. And here's where we learn the primary difference between choosing to serve and choosing to be a servant. Richard Foster again um, discusses this distinction thoroughly. And here's how he basically describes the two paths. When we choose to serve, we're still in charge. We decide who, what, when, why, where, and even how we will serve. When we are the ones in charge, we will spend a lot of time worrying about being taken advantage of. We will be tempted to complain and to argue but when we choose to be a servant, we give up our right to be in charge. And that's ultimately freeing because we cannot be manipulated or held against our will because we volunteered ourselves to be available and vulnerable under God's leading. So then, in order to become a servant, we must first decide our master. 
C. Gene Wilkes, Christian author, he, he states, no one can be a servant without having a master. We must answer the question, who is the master of my life? Brothers and sisters, if God is truly the master of our individual lives, then it is then our joy and our pleasure to become a witness and carrier of his love and good news through servanthood to all people. Uh, to step into every space, to serve people of many different persuasions and types, and to look out for their interests and benefit, reflecting the example of Jesus Christ himself, and refusing to demand my rights or to complain about anything, and, and being willing to give my own life for their greatest benefit. Not because I owe anyone anything, but because that's what it means to live with the love of God as my center. And that's what it means to participate in the good news, not just to know the good news, but to actually partake in it, to be a part of it. And that's what it means for God to be the master. As Jesus said in John 13, no servant is greater than his master. Paul says that those who choose to actually become servants will shine as lights in the midst of a crooked generation. If we shine, then people notice. And when they notice, they become curious. And if they are curious, then there's an opportunity for them to become convinced. And if they are convinced, then there is no loss for anyone. Church, um, God humbles the proud, for sure. I think we can, all, we can all attest to that. God will humble the proud. But don't forget the second half of that verse. He also will exalt the humble. That was true of Christ, and it is also true of us. Now, God is no respecter of men, and he certainly has no need for anybody in this room or anybody outside of this room. But our Father does bless and honor those who learn humility in servanthood. So then, we, church, carry the love and good news of Jesus by serving others. We make impact through small, everyday helps. We hold no discrimination as we serve even the least of these because we know that how we serve them is, in fact, how we serve God as well. Uh, let's just, um, real quick, this is not planned, but let's turn to Matthew 25, just real quick. I got time. And I'm running the service today, so what are you going to do? Leave? <laughs> Matthew 25. If you're watching online, you can turn with us as well. Matthew 25. Um, let's just start in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then we will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king, that is Jesus, he will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous, they will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them truly. I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. 
And then (laughs) he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? But then the king will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. I do not want to be found on that day with God saying what you were unwilling to do for the least of these so you did not do for me. We believe as a church that we can change our church and our community when we serve the least of these for the glory of God and the joy of the other. Humble servanthood is extremely important for us who want to become healthy and holy disciples and followers of Jesus. And I'll just finish with a quote. In his book, A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life, William Law, an author of the 18th century, encouraged us to, quote, condescend to all the weaknesses and infirmities of your fellow creatures, cover their frailties, Love their excellencies, encourage their virtues, relieve their wants, rejoice in their prosperities, compassionate their distress, receive their friendship, overlook their unkindness, forgive them their malice. Be a servant of servants and condescend to do the lowest offices to the lowest of mankind. That's what it means to be a servant. Let's pray. First and foremost, Lord, what can we say? But thank you. What can we say? But but thank you for the servant, Jesus Christ, who suffered and died on our behalf. He humbled himself by becoming obedient even to death death on a cross and what greater display can we see of the correlation between servanthood and the love of God that even us who who, who we are very different from you in fact we we work against you in a lot of ways But Jesus came and and died on our behalf. Looking out for our interests and our good. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we remember that. Because of your word today, the example of Paul, the example of Jesus himself. We remember that we are not above our master. No servant is greater than his master. And so, Lord, for those of us in the room who just declare you as the master of our life, we say we must be a servant. We cannot both be masters. (laughs) And so we posture ourselves in humility and in submission to you, Lord to those around us. And we do all things without grumbling or complaining. Lord, humble us. Would you bring low the proud and exalt the humble? Just as you said you would. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, at this time, we're going to move into our time of worship through giving and generosity. Again, we, we believe this is a continuance of our worship this morning. This is not a break or a pause from our worship today. This is another way in which we worship the Lord by, by giving to the furtherance of his kingdom. And so um, let's go ahead and have our ushers receive our offering at this time. For those of you who are watching online today, there is a way for you to give online. Um, I believe you can text the number that's on the screen, or you can look for the Give Today button on our website. You can also give in your communication cards if you fill those out. Um, if you missed the basket or you're still filling that out, you can um, give that to the ushers as you're walking out the door today. Uh, just as a reminder, for those of you in person, we do have our fellowship tent open. It's, it's, a, it's a heated tent. It's nice and warm and toasty in there. And we'd love for you to come join us. We have bagels and donuts and muffins and tea and coffee and, uh, and, and Ed, he's there too. So, um, so come and join us uh, in the fellowship tent. You can follow the ramp all the way down and it'll bring you to the tent. So good to see some. of your word and in the power of your spirit would you send us out and bring us back together at the next appointed time in jesus name we do pray and the church said amen, amen. you may go in peace